um, the fourth and final speaker will be introduced by Jonathan. Okay, thanks, Bella. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Lisa Kaltenegger, who is an associate professor at Cornell's Department of Astronomy and the director of the Carl Sagan Institute at Cornell. Um, Dr. Kaltenegger is an internationally renowned expert in modeling and identifying potential habitable worlds and their detectable spectral fingerprints, uh, modeling various detectable signatures of light, and observing features of rocky planets. Her research examines if our concept of habitability is accurate and the identification of habitable planets by focusing her research on the search for extrasolar and exoplanets that are rocky, Earth-like, and orbit in the habitable zone of their host star, much like Earth. Um, currently, she also serves on the National Science Foundation's Astronomy and Astrophysics Advisory Committee and is a science team member of NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite Mission. And fun fact, she actually has an asteroid named after her uh, called asteroid Kaltenegger 7734. Um, she's going to give us a talk about whether we're alone in the cosmos and the search for extraterrestrial life. So Dr. Kaltenegger, thanks so much for um, being with us today and please take it away. Hi, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. And I can't really tell you yet whether we're alone in the cosmos, but I'll show you how we're working on it. And hopefully in this really cool forum about research uh, for undergrads, I want to also stress that some of the people who actually have done incredibly important work for this in my lab and in others' labs are actually undergrad researchers. So if anybody's interested and trying to find life in the cosmos, or I'm sure trying to cure cancer or something. Now is one of these great, great places where uh, professors are actually generally, I would say, happy to have undergrads in their labs. And you can get this research experience, you can get it for uh, credit. So independent research is what it's called. And in case you're ever curious about something, just email the people in the faculty. And I think that goes for other universities as well. But so if you're interested, do that because I think really, really interesting science questions unanswered that you might be able to help with. And so with that, I would actually like to, let me just check. I'm just gonna share my screen with you so you can see uh, a little bit of things that uh, I'm working on. So I just wanna give you a little bit of a flavor of what we do. And also like Dr. Weinberg, I'll give you a little bit of an insight in uh, where I come from uh what my travel to the position that i'm in right now has been and if you have any questions as before just please uh email the questions in i think to uh, annabella or put it in the chat and we'll just gonna get to the question at the end of this talk or when we're in the panel so the question is that i really find interesting is are we alone in the cosmos and that's the question that has been around for 2000 years at least people were always looking up at the stars and wondering whether or not we alone in the universe and so another way to think about it if you want is actually to say okay so 4.6 billion years of solitude because the earth and the sun the star and the planet formed together, formed about 4.6 billion years ago. So that billion with a B, lots and lots of years ago. But life started to be around, we'd say like for sure 3.5 billion years ago, maybe a bit earlier. So life started pretty early. And so then the question is, if it started on the earth, how could we find it? And are there planets out there that could provide conditions that are similar to the early Earth or to modern Earth. So conditions that could potentially provide us uh, with RNA and DNA uh, or a kind of different strategy of how to get life started. And there you start to get into this region where we really don't know what alternative paths could take, but it's interesting to think about this. Nevertheless, that's the biologist working on it. I'll give you the astrophysics view. So the people who look at the stars and trying to find new worlds out there. But I was asked, like my predecessors or my, the people who gave the talks before, about uh, talking a little bit about my uh, career path. And I have a little bit of a different one uh, compared to Professor Weinberg before. So I am from Austria. 
tiny country in the middle of Europe. And then in the tiny country, I'm actually from a tiny town. So there are about a thousand people in the center of town. And if you count all the outsides, it's about 7,000 people. It's called Kuhl. It's a little bit south of Salzburg, sound of music, if you know. And so there was really no, I had no idea in my mind that I would become an astronomer that would actually work with NASA and other space agencies on these big telescopes that would look out there for life like we know it. So that was very, very far from my mind, really, because I didn't really think that that was something for people like me. And so by studying, I actually realized that the uh, scientific community is incredibly international. And, you know, we're not as diverse as we should be, but uh, it's getting a little bit better. So this is space for everyone if you're really interested in that topic. And at one point, somebody asked me if uh, people from different universities, you know, if you go to a meeting, if people like, what is the sorting, you know, are people like, are all the people from Cornell together and all the people from MIT together and so on and so forth. And that's definitely not the case, at least in astronomy, it's by topic. If you are studying the sun, all the people, the sun will be in one cluster. If you study a specific star, all the people. So, you know, it's topic wise that we segregate in a way. But here I just wanted to show you a few things. So this is Harvard. This is where I did my first postdoc, the research that you do if you want to become a, a professor generally after your PhD. So that's uh, that's me here uh, at the stairs of Harvard. And then this is, of course, Cornell, where five years, six years ago now, I started the Carl Sagan Institute, and that combines 15 different departments trying to figure out how we could find life in the universe. So if you're interested and you love music, we have a music professor who works with us. If you love engineering, if you love bio, you know, if this is a topic you're interested in, there's a lot of really interesting people thinking about this and doing research on it. And then here, this is the ESA, the European Space Agency. This is where I did my PhD. And then my master's, I did actually in the Canary Islands. It's in Spain. It's where they have a lot of different telescopes, so you can actually do lots of observations. And then after I did my postdoc at Harvard, I went to Germany to the Max Planck Institutes. And there I led my own team of researchers uh, asking about how we could find life in the universe. But I just wanted to tell you that, uh, as I said before, science is very um, connected, I would say. And sometimes, at least internationally, very diverse. We're working with people from many, many different countries. And so I just wanted to show you uh, the different places that I have worked or studied uh, during my career so far. And so uh, these are four places, four different places in the US. And then there are a couple of places in Europe. And I also wanted to bring this map in because as a scientist, once in a while, it's really a good idea to uh, figure out what assumptions you were making, right? And for example, the north is up, right? Who said north is up in, uh, in a global map is one of the things that everybody knows, right? But on the other hand, you can just flip it around and you automatically see how much harder it is to change your point of view, your perception. But it's really, really important once in a while. So I just threw this map in with south up just to remind you to once in a while uh, question your assumption or make sure that you know your assumptions are not just educated and ingrained in you and see a problem or see something with a different point of view. Maybe you'll find out something interesting. So this is a few of my team currently at Cornell. So of course, this was before we, uh, when we could still meet. And so basically you see the people and uh, this is our pale blue dot so far. If this were in color, you'd see that we have a pale blue dot so far. Carl Sagan talked about the earth as a pale blue dot. And I just wanted to give you another overview where they are from. So these are the people in my team. And so the, my pe the people in my team are also from all over the world. So uh, it's basically the idea that you follow, the interest that you follow in science a lot of the times. As Professor Weinberg said, you can also stay in one place and hopefully there are opportunities for you to stay in one place. But I think the reality is that for younger people in science currently, it is very normal that you actually move. Sometimes you don't have to, but it gives you much more flexibility if you move, you know, at least within the United States or maybe even further. And the idea there is that you actually learn something completely new. Because of course, 
in this university where you study, you know the professors, you learn what they know, but then if you go to a completely different place, you learn what these people think, the tools they use, and you can bring that back or combine all of that in your research, in your thinking. And this is what things what um, allows you to come up with new ideas, come up with new ways of trying to figure something out. And so I think uh, my travel, you know, my living all over the world, uh, and then uh, for a short amount of times, but sometimes like up to a couple of years, and then having people from all these different places of the world, by chance really, just happen to be that way, is just uh, something that enriches our team because we have lots of different points of view, lots of different tools that people know, lots of different insights that help us actually address questions at the forefront of science. And so, as I said before, that Carl Sagan Institute here at Cornell, so it was founded about six years ago, it has 35 uh, researcher faculties and senior researchers, and then lots of research associates, PhD students and undergrads. So if you're interested uh, in trying to find life in the universe, you know, reach out to the Carl Sagan Institute or to some of the people you see here. As I said, for example, Andrew here, is a music professor. He's thinking about the music of the stars or the music of the cosmos, for example. We have astrophysics, engineering, bio, um, science communication, earth and atmospheric science. So lots and lots and lots of different topics that you can think about. And the idea is that we want to create together the toolkit to find life in the universe. And we want to share it with the public. So this is why science communication and art and music and performing arts is in there too. So if you want to know anything more, here's the website, carlsaganinstitute.cornell.edu. And you can find us on Twitter at CSINST, Carl Sagan Institute, and me, you can find at Kaltenegger Lisa in case you're interested in, uh, in more, uh, more information about us. So, but let's get to the topic about are we alone in the universe? And so basically, I can tell you yet but we are very, very close to figuring it out. And to address this question, let me just start with where are we? So this is an image of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, we call it the Milky Way. And so what you see is there is a big kind of, in the center, there seems to be like, if you made it in a DVD and in the center, you'd have like a pinball, and so that would be the shape. So very, very thin. And in the middle, you would have a bulge. And so the middle, the bulge, maybe you've heard about this before, is where there is a black hole or a super massive object. But you don't see it. You don't see anything black in the middle, right? You see this white thing here. And there's also a little bit wrong color coded. So it's not really pink. But uh, what you see here is like the last stars that actually orbit around this massive object in our center of our universe, uh, center of our galaxy, sorry. There's lots of galaxies in the universe. So in the center of our galaxy is a super massive black hole. And that's what the physics Nobel Prize was given for this year, for example. Yes, you can figure out because you know where they are and how fast they move, how much mass needs to be in that small area that they orbit around, that they move around to hold on to them, to basically when they're so fast, they're not flying away, they're actually kept by the gravity of the black hole in the center. And this is how we figure out that if it were normal mass, like we know it, normal stuff, like a table, a star, a planet, you and me, it would have to be much, much, much bigger than the space we have for it. And so then you get to the place where you say it's so dense that it's uh, something very, very different than normal matter. And so this is how you figured out that in the center of our galaxy and of nearly every, every galaxy, there is a, a super dense object, a black hole. That's what we call it because not even light can escape. And I'm more than happy to talk about this more a little, a, a little later. So our Milky Way is about roughly 100,000 light years across. And so what that means is that even light, the fastest speed there is, needs about 100,000 years from one side to the other. So take that and fold it in, you automatically see that actually your view of the night sky is a view back in time. 
So the light that you see today when you walk out looking at the star was sent out by that star years and years, sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands of years ago. But it arrives right now, today, at your eye because light, like a car, needs time to travel. Light is way faster than that, than a car, of course. But it's also really fun because think about it. You can actually find, let's assume you are, let's say, 20 years old. So you could go online and you could put in a star 20 light years away. If you do that and you find that star, Google can actually tell you which one it is, and then you find it on the night sky. Then when you look at it, say you're 20 years, then you see the light that the star sent out when you were born tonight. And it makes a really great and cheap birthday presents or Christmas presents in case you're thinking about this right now for the whole friends and family because it's kind of really beautiful I think being connected to the cosmos and realizing that the light from the stars that arrive at our eye today right now has been sent out a while ago and so all of this together to me makes me connected with the cosmos even more because we connected in space, right? We are one star that moves within these 200 billion stars in our own galaxy alone. But we also connected in time because the further away something is, the further in time or the earlier on in the history of the universe we see it. This is also how we figured out how the universe was born, this whole idea about the Big Bang. And so all of this, I'm more than happy to talk about later, but uh, in case you're interested, Astronomy 101 is, for example, one of the classes that will tell you all about that. But let's just talk about the search, the search for life in the universe. You could think, well, we just have to look around all the stars and find another Earth-like planet. Good thinking. However, it's extremely tricky. It's extremely tricky because light uh, goes out in the sphere. So if you double as far away from a light source like a star or a torch, then it only appears to you one quarter as bright. And so the further away you are from something bright, the dimmer it appears to you. So we're looking in about a thousand light year range that is depicted here around our own star, the sun, for planets that could potentially be like the Earth. And so what have we found so far? Well, we found more than 4,000 planets orbiting other stars than our sun. Our sun is a star. These other stars are other suns with planets around them, basically. The name of our star is sun. So these other stars have different names. But what we found, and this is now an artist impression, right? So we have not seen those planets. And any picture that I show you today that is not just the dot of light for a planet other than the earth is an artist impression we have beautiful beautiful images for it but we don't know much more about it we know how big they are we know how massive they are so we can figure out how dense they are if they're rock like the earth or if they're gas ball like for example jupiter or saturn but the color and all of this whether they have rings or not is something that's really really hard to measure but I like it because one of the things that it brings home, this artist's impression of all these thousands of new worlds out there, is that they are very, very different. And they are much more different than we ever expected them to be. And so I'm happy to talk about more about this big, giant planets we found because it's much easier to find something big, like Jupiter out there, than to find something small, like the Earth out there. And by small, I mean, if you take our own sun, and you put the Earth 110 times next to each other, that's the diameter of the sun. So the sun, the star, is so much bigger and brighter than this tiny, tiny planet, the pale blue dot, the Earth, that gives us life. But the Earth is our key to finding life in the universe because it's the only place that we know of so far that actually hosts life. And it hosts a beautiful, diverse biosphere, of course. And so 30 years ago, Voyager 1, it's a small, tiny satellite, started. And 
Carl Sagan, who was a professor here in the astronomy department, convinced NASA that before the Voyager 1 probe was flung out of our solar system, it's en route to the next star, and it has a golden record with humankind's music on it, for music lovers everywhere. Before that, he convinced NASA to have it look back at our own planet. And what you see here is to date, the furthest away image photograph that we have of our own sun. And this is our sun. This is what inspired Carl Sagan's beautiful, beautiful poem off the pale blue dot describing our own planet. So this tiny dot is what you see if you're just a little bit further than Saturn and look back with a, uh, with a spacecraft trying to find us. So he used it very, very beautifully to say, and so just think about how many fights are fought to just be the uh, reigning person uh, for one part of the pixel of this pale blue dot, you know? And so it kind of becomes really weird to think about how we fight about land in our countries if what the whole planet is, is this tiny dot suspended in the vastness of space and it's also fragile. We have to take care of it because there is no other planet like ours out there. And so we need to uh, safeguard it because it's what makes us live and what supports life, the only place that we know of that does that so far. But so when you think about this top dot, if you could zoom in, this is what you would see, right? So you would see the continents, you would see the oceans, you would see the clouds, but we won't have enough light to do that but we will have a light to actually split the light in its individual colors. It's called spectroscopy. And so light and matter interact. When light hits a specific molecule or atom, the molecule can start to rotate or swing because of the energy in the light that hit it. Or an electron can get more energy and go to another uh, orbital. But what happens then is that the light that gets to me, to my telescope, will have some missing parts because those missing parts, that energy was actually used to interact with molecules or atoms. And so by what's missing in the light, that's what tells you what the atmosphere of such a planet is made out of. And if you do that for the Earth, if you create its light fingerprints, so all of this mountains, vegetation, oceans, clouds, create a light fingerprint for our own planet. If you look at that, you see gases that indicate life on our own planet. They have to be in a big amount, but the combination of oxygen or ozone with a reducing gas like methane, can, we cannot explain that by anything else than life. And we also would like water because all the life that we know on the earth actually needs some water. But this is how this would look like. So here you have the different wavelengths. Here we are in the infrared, just because it's easier to show. Five microns to 20 microns. So we see the heat being emitted from this body. And if you know anything about infrared, if something is hot, it will actually give you a curve, a, a black body curve off its flux off the energy it emits. But you see, this doesn't look much like a curve. You can spot a curve roughly, but there are things missing. And those things missing are basically light interacting with specific molecules. And at a specific wavelengths or specific color, it can only be that specific molecule or atom. And so by knowing which light I'm missing, like here, for example, I know that the atmosphere of our own planet must have CO2 and must have water, ozone, and methane here. So this is how you can read the air of a planet very, very, very far away without going there. And so the light that flies for free through the universe, through the cosmos, that we catch in our big telescopes is actually what allows us to read the composition of planets very, very far away. And we are having big, big telescopes that are coming online 
that will allow us to actually connect, collect enough of these photons. They are not done yet. The next one is actually in a year, the first one that will be allowed, that will be possible to collect enough light to do that. The James Webb Space Telescope, Halloween 2021 is when it's supposed to launch, 6.5 meter diameter in space. So I usually say when I'm in class about three times me, three to four times me is the diameter of these telescopes we're building, we're flying to space. Interesting also, think about it, the history of life on our planet was not always the same. We weren't walking around with dinosaurs, right? And even before that, as I said, about 3.5 billion years ago are the oldest traces that we can find of life of the Earth. So life has actually changed significantly since it started on our own planet. And so the environment has also changed significantly. This is roughly what it looks like right now. Then this is about 2 billion years ago, lots of volcanoes. And then early on, there was still a big, heavy bombardment of the young Earth. And the moon was much closer to us than it is right now. And that, of course, also translates into what kind of biota you have. And there's a big discussion going on back and forth. What comes first? Does the biota change the planet? Does the planet um, the changes in the planet allow biota to evolve. It's probably an interconnection. The two actually interacting with each other, changing the planet, making conditions for different kinds of life available again. And so initially, like, meter in diameter. So here, if you look very closely, you see people in comparison size-wise. But that bigger of a telescope on the ground, because you have the atmosphere actually making it harder to observe what light comes in from the stars, is what we're going to need to collect enough light from these small planets to figure out if any of these signs of life are in their atmosphere. And so because I started by saying that, uh, hopefully, uh, some of you are interested in actually doing this. I just wanted to bring this one up. So this was uh, the beginning of this year. And this is Safan, Safan Lin. So he's one of the undergrads in my lab. And uh, this was a paper that he led that the Cornell Chronicle uh, um, led with. And basically it was about if there's life on the next over planet that could have life, we don't know if it has it yet, because as I said, the big telescopes are not there yet then uh, he calculated how that would look to our telescopes and how long we have to observe to be able to find it. And so in a way, what I wanted to leave you with, and uh, then I'm happy to answer questions or during, during the panels, is that are we alone in the universe oh, is a question that we haven't figured out yet. But we are getting the tools and we're getting the telescopes to do it. And so are we in the alone in the universe? I really hope we're not, it'd be really boring. And one out of five stars. So if you go out at night and count to five, one out of five stars has a planet that could potentially be like the earth. That's what we know already. And so with 200 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way alone, I like our chances. I like our numbers of how many potentially earth-like planets are out there, but whether or not they have life, is a completely open question that we don't know yet. But we can use all the help we can get to figure it out is one of the things I would say. And with that, uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions or if you guys decide we should do it in the panel, just let me know what you prefer. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaltenegger. I think um, we will we will go ahead and proceed with the with the panel at this point. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Of course.